Okay, guys. We'll get started. Uh, so today's topic is uh, mechanism design. Uh, and we'll start with a Bayesian, Bayesian game with communication where we'll study a generalization of correlated equilibrium and then we'll move on to more complex uh, topics in mechanism design. Okay, so the simplest topic is a strict generalization of correlated equilibrium. But before I uh, start this whole new set of topics, uh, I want to uh, motivate this uh, this topic by uh, uh, pointing out to you some applications that are used that uses mechanism design at its core. Uh, so, traffic control. If you go to LA. Okay, and if you're driving on the road, you will see a signal. So there is a high, high speed lane uh, along some of the highways there in LA. And it may be there in other cities too. I know that it's there in London, it's there in many European cities. But I've not, I've not seen it with my own eyes. Okay, so the LA one is something that I've seen with my own eyes. So I can say with certainty that it's there. And so if you're driving there, at every point of time during the day, it will have a number. like. If you want to enter this highway at this time, you have to pay 50 cents. If you want to enter the highway at the peak traffic time, you have to pay $10. And so it ranges all the way from 50 cents to $10 or whatever the upper limit is, depending upon how much the traffic is on the road. Okay, so, so you want to design a pricing policy that maximizes the social benefit. So you want to reduce the congestion on the highway but you also want people who are willing to pay a higher price, you want to give them a very high speed lane so that they can just zoom past all that traffic without having to think about, uh, uh, think about uh, all the time that will be spent in the traffic. Okay, so, so the goal, so, so there everybody is thinking what is best for himself or herself and they are driving on the road and what you as a mechanism designer have to think is what should the pricing be. Okay, so that you can earn maximum amount of money, but at the same time you provide some sort of benefit to the consumer. So that's one application. The second application is resource allocation in wireless networks. So the idea is you have a shared, shared uh, wi wireless or communication network, and you want to provide uh, communication benefit to every user. Okay, so somehow you have to make sure that you allocate certain amount of bandwidth to each user so that the user can use that bandwidth to communicate with uh, whoever other person that uh, that person wants to communicate with okay so you have to have think about the idea of fairness what is fair who's willing to pay how much how much bandwidth should i give to this person based on how much he's willing to pay me and so on then if you think about amazon cloud uh, amazon has a large cloud resource uh, you can ask for one server all the way up to one million server. Well, maybe not a million, but a thousand server. Okay, and uh, and the question there is uh, how much? So users are coming in. So Amazon has this big cluster that they can uh, rent out to other people in the market. So the question for Amazon is what should the pricing be? How should the pricing be done so that they can extract maximum amount of money? from the, their customers who are actually willing to use that cloud server. So some of the things that you can think about, let's say you want to do uh, face detection in the photographs. So Facebook receives one million photographs every day and Facebook wants to detect faces. So face detection is not a critical, is not a critical thing for Facebook, okay? So it can be done during off-peak times, okay, during the nights. So they can detect all the phases, they can tag it and so on. But on the other hand, if you look at Netflix, which runs completely on Amazon Cloud now, uh, if a person wants to watch a video, it's a time sensitive thing. You know, they don't wait, they won't wait for off peak hours to watch the video, right? So again, Facebook has, to, uh, sorry, Amazon has to think about how should the pricing be done so that it can get maximum benefit for, uh, from selling its resource to other people. And then you have electricity markets where uh, generators and uh, load-serving entities, they all bid in order to uh, 
um, figure out how much electricity should be generated and how much electricity should be consumed, how much should be generated by whom, and what should the prices be. Okay, so there is a government entity called independent system operator which decides what the prices should be and how much each generator should, pr should produce and how much each load serving entity should consume and so on. Okay, then there is job scheduling on the cloud. You have lots of jobs on a single server. You want to somehow schedule it based on whatever the customers are willing to pay. And then there is airline scheduling, which is also a big problem, wherein you have airlines waiting uh, to go on the runway, but the runway can only fly one plane in one minute. Okay, let's say that's the constraint. So which airline should be allowed to go first? Which airline should be allowed to go last? So if you have traveled on Spirit Airlines or you know, some of these low fare airlines, you will see that uh, sometimes you will have to wait inside the airline quite a bit of time. And that's because the runway is being given to people who have higher priority, okay? Because they are willing to pay more amount of money to, to uh, fly. It, it may or may not be true, but, but these are the things that you should think about when I'm talking about mechanism design. There are lots of engineering applications where mechanism design has become commonplace. There are some services and some uh, uh, products that it doesn't matter how much the price is, we will still pay for it. Does this like lie within this? What, sorry, what, what's the question? Can you some be a bit? Some goods or some products like cigarettes or something. Right. Uh, like no matter how much the price would be, people would still be able to would yeah. still pay for it. That's right. Does this still lie within the mechanism design? That's a very good question. Okay, so here is the, 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 the question is cigarettes, it's a problem for the community, for people. So even if people are willing to pay a higher price for the cigarettes, whether it should be allowed to be sold in the market or not. You know, that's a, there, there is something in economics known as public goods. Okay, so public goods is road. You cannot exclude anyone else from using the road. Just if, if you built a road, everyone can use it. Okay, if you've built a path, everyone can use it. So health, it depends on whether you as a society consider health as a public good or as a private good. Okay, so if health is a public good, it means government has to provide health care to everyone. In which case, cigarettes should be completely banned because people will have lung cancer and then the government will have to provide health services for that. Okay, uh, on the other hand, if Health is not a public good if it's considered a private good in a society, which is the case in the US, where you are responsible for your health care, in which case cigarette is completely fine. If you want to kill yourself, please go ahead and kill yourself. I mean, we don't care, right? So, uh, so and if you, if, you, if you smoke for a long time and you have health problems because of that, I mean, go ahead and take care of yourself. I mean, the government is not responsible. So it really depends on what the society thinks health should it be a public good or should it be a private good? Okay. Uh, and, like my question is more concerned with uh, like the behavior of the people to buy some things, mm -hmm. and you would sometimes pay more, much more than they would really cost. Right. Because they just can't, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, that happens all the time. Yeah. Electricity. Can't yeah. Get, yeah, like electricity for some for consumers. Right. People must use electricity all that whole time, right? So right. If we do not, if we like uh, get kept the prices very high for electricity, people will still buy them that will pay for it. Right. So does this still lie within mechanism design? So first, demand and demand. Yes. So mechanism design can allow you to shape the demand. So let's say, why would you keep a price of electricity high? Probably you want to curtail the demand. Right? And so if you want to curtail the demand, then you will make sure that the price is such that the demand is actually equal to what you want it to be. Okay? So as a mechanism designer, that's what you want. You want to come up with the right set. In fact, you know, now that you brought this electricity uh, point, Uber does that. Okay? So you know that Uber has a surge pricing. Okay? So, uh, so let's say this is a big city, okay? but you are in this area. And Uber suddenly says, you know, if you're taking a car, if you're riding a car in this area and the number of riders is high and the number of drivers is low, it will say that, well, you have to pay 1.5x the fare. Okay, so that's surge. 
And that depends on the time of the, I mean, that depends on a lot of factors, OK? So this number is essentially trying to curtail the demand, OK? So, so Uber is acting as a mechanism designer. By coming up with this number, 1.5, 1.25, 1.3, it's trying to move the demand either across time or it's trying to just trim the demand. So if you want to go and eat in a restaurant, you see 1.5x, you just decide not to eat it. But you have to go catch a flight or maybe uh, buy, buy groceries, you will probably go at a later point of time when it goes from 1.5x to 1.2 or 1.1x. Okay. So yes, it is very much within the framework of mechanism design. So the so there are there are there are two parties in mechanism design. One is the designer, which could be company like Uber or Amazon. It could be government. Uh, what else? It could be an auctioneer. You know about auctioneer? So if you you know, when somebody, somebody dies in the family, then they hire an auctioneer who will look at the table, chair, utensils, whatever, furniture. They'll collect everything and then they will auction it in the market. Okay? So auctioneer, so they design the, they are the mechanism designer. Okay? And then there are participants who, you can think of them as players. Okay, so this, this can also be a player. So in case of Uber, by keeping a specific price, Uber's point is to maximize its uh, profit. Okay, so designer can have motive or it may not have any motive. Okay, Pr participants always have a motive. Okay, players always have a motive. They want to maximize their utility. So what would designers be able to do? So their job is to design a game, okay? So the, they want to design a game and, and their control is and by A, picking who knows what and when. Uh, picking who acts when. Maybe picking is not the right verb to use, but. And then C, deciding on what payments slash tax to uh, tax to the players. Okay, you know, in fact, taxation is also very much within the framework of mechanism design. You know, if you uh, if you look at history, um, countries where there is high taxation, people are not willing to pay that higher higher tax, and then they will there will be a lot of uh, people who wouldn't who wouldn't reveal their true income, okay? And this kind of thing happens, for instance, in <coughs> India, where a lot of, where 3% of the population pays tax, 97% don't pay income tax, okay? So that happens in many countries around the world. And then, if your tax is too low, then the government cannot provide military, security, medical, whatever, roads, infrastructure, and stuff. So it turns out that maybe 25 to 40 percent tax rate is kind of optimal. So people are willingly, people are willing to give their true income and then pay appropriate taxes. Uh, and so if you go above 40, then you are in trouble. Okay, people will not reveal their true income. And if you go below 25, you can't pay for the services, the the public services to the people. So, so it's a part of mechanism design. And you know this. It's kind of funny if you look at the U.S. Uh, income tax code. It's a, it's a huge, huge document. Okay, you can just get drowned in that entire information. 
uh, if you are filing taxes, of course, your taxes are pretty simple. Uh, but if you start uh, owning real estate and stuff, then it becomes extremely difficult uh, to keep track of everything. So, uh, so that's all part of mechanism design. Whether your taxation policy should be extremely difficult, like it's the case in US, or it should be very simple. And I don't know in which country you have simple taxes. But you know, some states in the US do have simple taxes. So if you go to Seattle, I think there is no state tax there, so you don't have to pay any taxes to the state. But if you go and buy, I don't know, shampoo or spinach or whatever, then you pay 10% taxes on, on the material. So there are states who have sort of simplified their taxes because they don't want to burden the person with figuring out the state tax laws, you know, which are completely different from federal tax laws. So a a anyway, that's too much of, uh, of uh, random things. Yeah, motivation, yeah, <laughs> okay. So I'm 100% I'm, I'm, I'm sure that now you are all motivated to learn what I'm going to tell you uh, now. So <coughs> the first topic is Bayesian game with communication. And I want you to think of it as a generalization of correlated equilibrium. Uh, one thing that I did not mention here, that what is the designer trying to, I mean, what is he trying to do? So in this case, and in most cases, the designer wants to elicit truthful information from the participants. Okay, so, so what's the setting here? There are three stages at stage one. Each player, the mediator, So in this case, I'm not uh, talking about a designer, I'm talking about a mediator. Mediator seeks types Ti in capital Ti, okay? So player I decides on a map T i that maps T i to T i. So T i, this is his true type space. And then of course the play, player i, when mediator asks each player what is your type, the player can lie, okay? So this is a map which talks about whether he wants to lie or not. So if C i is an identity map, then the player has no incentive to lie. Then at stage two, mediator, Uh, chooses or generates action profile from all i profile mu that maps t1 cross tn to delta a1 an. Okay, so based on the types that are reported by the players, the mediator picks some set of actions that the player should take according to some distribution. And then in stage three, mediator recommends AI and player, player picks, player acts according to lambda i that maps a i to a i. Thank you. 
Okay? So, remember in correlated equilibrium, this stage was completely absent. The mediator would just generate a set of action profile. It will recommend that action to every player. And then the player will either choose to play that action or it can switch the action. So this is the player's uh, uh, strategy at stage three, where player I can, if lambda I was identity, then player I is going to use the recommendation of the mediator. If lambda I is not identity, then it means that player I, uh, even though mediator recommends some action, player I might just play some other action, okay? So, so that's the, that's the three stages. Uh, in this case, uh, the mediator, so each player has some private information, which we will call type, TI, which sits in the space capital TI. And then the mediator wants to know that information. Player can lie, potentially. Okay, so if its true type is TI, it will give TI prime. It will say TI prime to the mediator, and then mediator will make use of that TI prime to generate the action profile and then the player might switch uh, and not follow the recommendation of the mediator. The type spaces are common information. The type spaces are common information, yeah. The spaces are common information but not the true type. And of course each player will have some payoff, expected payoff. J i, which will depend on. Let me let me define gamma i to be C i and lambda i. Okay. So C i is about reporting the type. Lambda i is about following the recommendation. So this will be gamma one, gamma n, and mu, and that will be the expected value of u i of t one to t n. A1 to An, okay? And of course, T1 to Tn, it might have some prior, mediator might have some prior, or uh, there might be a prior distribution on the type. And then A1 to An is induced here by whether the players have actually followed the recommendation or not, okay? So that's the expectation. This expectation takes into account there is this expectation due to mu because mu randomizes among all possible action profiles. Okay. What would the mediator what would the mediator want in this case? What, what did what did the mediator wanted in the correlated equilibrium case? The mediator wanted the players to follow the recommendation, right? So mediator wanted lambda i to be an identity map for all the players. So the idea there was, what was the idea in correlated equilibrium? The idea was, if every player plays the identity map, then it is in the best interest of player i to also play the identity map, right? So what should the goal of mediator be here? What should the goal of mediator be? Well, uh, find mu so that gamma i truthful truthful which means identity and identity okay so both these uh, both these maps ci and lambda i should be identity so that gamma i truthful is the best response response given no given all other players <coughs> act truthfully okay so that's the goal So it turns out that of course such a strategy would exist if 
everything was finite, FTI is finite, AI is finite. It essentially boils down to solving a convex, solving a convex problem. Okay, so just like it was the case in correlated equilibrium. Okay, you have to find a feasible solution to a bunch of inequalities, and this uh, theorem is such a mu exist in finite games. And such a mu is known as a mu so that truthful is the best response if all other prayers acted truthfully. Uh, that uh, that mu is known as incentive compatible. Okay, so mu is incentive compatible. I'll just write it here. Such a mu is called incentive compatible. Okay. So if all players act truthfully, so if mu is incentive compatible, if the system designer or the mediator was able to use an incentive compatible mu, then it is in the best interest of every player to be truthful, assuming that all other players act truthfully. Okay. Now in some games, you will hear something called dominant strategy incentive compatible which means that being truthful is dominant strategy no matter what other players are doing okay so that's a fairly strong uh, class of incentives uh, but this is not the case in general you can only talk about incentive compatible and not dominant strategy incentive compatible there is another um, version of this uh, well, I wouldn't say version, it's a completely different theorem. It's called revelation principle. Where should I write? Revelation principle, which says that message space, space does not matter. Okay, uh, uh, you know the, the real statement is much longer than that. Uh, but what I want to say is that the message space, what is the message space? Uh, what, what is the space, what is this space Ti? So instead of Ti, if I write <coughs> Mi, and so mu will be M1 to Mn, and this, so this is the message that player i is sending to the mediator and then mediator sends another message to each player. So this is not the action but what would it be? Uh, I need let us say n1, n1 to nn, okay. So this is some other, so this is the message that player i is using to reveal some information to the mediator. And then mediator is choosing some other message space in order to recommend player I a certain action. So it doesn't matter as long as, so if you can find a, a mu that is incentive compatible in this game, then you can also find a mu which is incentive compatible in the original game where the message space where the actual true type and the true action space, okay. So this will be n i. Okay, is that is that clear? So revelation principle says it doesn't matter what is the language between the players and the mediator and mediator and the player. Okay, it doesn't matter. What is fixed is T i and A i, right? Because that that cannot change. Okay, that's the true information. That's the true true type space and the true message true action space so that doesn't change but what changes is the messaging messages doesn't matter which language you use here doesn't matter okay it, it it's going to it's 
If you can find an incentive compatible mechanism in this space, you can always find an incentive compatible mechanism in this, in this particular game as well, where uh, the messages were true types and true actions. Yeah. Uh, how do we define incentive compatible if, like, say, lambda i is from n to a? Yeah, so in that case, you define mu to have some properties. Okay, so you design mu to have some property which is uh, desirable. Okay, so if in the original game mu wanted to have truthful information revelation, right, and following the recommendation, uh, in this in this game you will put some more constraints on mu that mu has to uh, let's say do the social good, take an action which is the best possible action among all, right? So. We'll, we'll talk about it in a bit, okay? So, yeah. I guess, any question on Bayesian game with communication? Okay. Yeah. Type space, yes, you can have prior distribution on the type space. Yeah, I, that would be needed in order to compute this expectation. Okay, so there are two uh, topics, uh, two minor things that I want to I want to talk about, uh, which is related to insurance industry. I mean, it's not necessarily related to insurance industry, but in general. Okay, uh, I will use the ideas from insurance industry to motivate that that topic. So those are adverse selection and moral hazard. So what is adverse selection and moral hazard? So I want to, uh, I'll, I'll again try to motivate you, okay? Let's say Mediator is an insurance agency and it wants to know whether you are a, a, a good driver or a bad driver, okay? Everyone is going to say they are a good driver, okay? Because the, the premiums are going to be lower. So in that case, your CI Uh, is essentially is not truthful. Okay, that is adverse selection. Okay, so as an insurance agency, I cannot expect everyone to actually reveal to me the true type of the player. So I have to essentially give insurance to everyone, no matter whether they are good driver or bad driver, I, everybody's going to tell me that they are good driver, therefore I have to give them insurance. Okay, so if CI is not truthful, and then there is moral hazard where lambda i is not, is not uh, identity. And this is moral hazard. So the way to think about it is, now that you have taken the insurance, the insurance, the insurance agency says, you know what, you should always drive safe, okay? But guess what? <laughs> this person is not using an identity map. So this person says, okay, whatever, you know, you tell me not to drive safe, but I don't care. I will drive rashly because I know that if I get into an accident, there is an insurance agency to cover me. Okay, so that's the moral hazard problem. Uh, so no matter how you, well, of course, in real life, because this is a repeated game, okay, this is not a static game, so you buy the insurance for next year and next year and next year and so on. Since it's a repeated game, there is a punishment phase, right? As, I, as we had mentioned, there is a punishment. So there is punishment, therefore, uh, they are somehow trying, so insurance agencies are able to avoid adverse selection as well as moral hazard. Okay, they are able to avoid it because of the repeated nature and because of the option of punishing the driver in the future. And you know, it's, it's important to know that the reason why insurance agencies are able to punish the driver is because everything is linked to your social security number. So if you get into an accident, your driving license and social security number will say that, well, this guy was involved in an accident and he was at fault, he or she was at fault. 
So because of that, that information is available to all insurance agencies. So you can't just keep switching your insurance agencies and assume that I can game the system, at least not in the US. Okay, and in countries where insurance agency wouldn't have this information, then you can game the system. This time you are with insurance agency one, next day you are with somebody else and so on. So, <coughs> and you, how, how do you avoid adverse selection? Well, you hire an auditor. What an auditor does is it checks all the previous record to figure out the type of the player. And in case of moral hazard, how do you avoid moral hazard? Well, you, you hire a regulator. Okay, so those are, so regulator regulates the behavior. So whatever is recommended, the regulator will ensure, in this case, in, in the case of US, regulators are essentially police, uh, the, the cops. So they ensure that whatever is recommended to you, if safe action, if safe driving is recommended to you, it will take an action if you engage in an unsafe driving behavior then regulators will kick in and they will try to get rid of the moral hazard problem. <coughs> okay. Any, any question about this? So these are all uh, topics in economics, so I don't want to go into it, otherwise they will kill this course. Economics department here will kill this course next year. Okay, so I'll just try to be very brief. But these are, these are ideas that you should have at the back of your mind, since you have taken a class in game theory. <coughs> okay. So the next topic is a uh, collective choice. Uh, Bayesian game with collective choice and the idea is pretty similar stage one mediator seeks ti in capital ti players decide Ti that maps Ti to Ti. In stage two, uh, mediator mu maps mu T1 cross Tn to A. This is the set of outcomes. So mediator maps into the set of outcomes. Mediator takes the information from every player and then maps it into the out into the outcomes, and then player I receives uh, utility C I to C N, and then mu, which is the expected value of the utility function T1 to T N comma A. Okay, so think about election, the mediator seeks which candidate you want to vote for and the players decide to cast their vote and then mediator says whoever gets the maximum vote becomes the president. Okay, and so each person gets an expected utility at the end of the game. <coughs> Those who like the president, they are happy. Those who don't, they are unhappy. Okay, so so that's the that's the game. So the this is not action. This is the set of outcomes. Uh, and so you can think about it in this way: if the mediator doesn't choose the outcome properly, then players will have an incentive to lie about who they want to vote for. Okay. So that's the uh, that's the idea here. So mediator wants to come up with an incentive. So mu is incentive compatible 
If all players are truthful, then it is in the best interest of player I to be truthful. Okay, that's an incentive compatible here. Incentive compatible mechanism in this case. And this is known as a, this is known as a, a Bayesian game with collective choice because this outcome is collective. It's not recommending an action to individual players. It's a collective outcome. So this is uh, useful, for instance, if you want to if you want to have a highway next to your house, you will hear a lot of noise, but then there are other people who are far away from the highway. They are very happy because now the highway is close to their house. Okay, so everyone is going to cast their vote, and people who will live close to the highway, they will cast a negative vote saying that, you know, we don't want a highway, otherwise our life will be a living hell. Okay, but, but then the mediator, which in this case would be a government, will figure out whether to build a highway or not based on overall considerations of all the participants. Okay. So that was uh, two very general setup, sufficiently general setup. Uh, one was Bayesian game with uh, communication, which was a generalization of uh, correlated equilibrium. And this is a collective choice problem. So now I want to get uh, more and more focused onto specific models. So the first thing, the next thing I want to cover is VCG mechanism, okay? That's one of the most important topics in mechanism design. Yeah. Parliament elections, uh -huh. there is a 10 percent barrier, and if the political party doesn't get that much, uh -huh. it's not represented in the parliament. I see. So okay. People just don't vote. I mean, even if they want to vote for like smaller parties, they just right. go with the bigger ones. So it's like yeah, 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 that's yeah, that's <laughs> so. In, so what uh, Denis is saying that in Turkey there is this rule that if your party gets less than 10 percent of the votes. Yeah. O overall votes, then you don't get representation in the parliament. So even if, so if you are a person, right, so that's the rule, that's the rule that the mediator has created, okay? So if you are a person and you want to vote for a party that you know for sure is not, uh, is not uh, a, a nationwide party, okay, then you will go to decide, go and decide with some nationwide party, so that's kind of prevents the party, the smaller party, to get any vote and be represented in the parliament. I mean, that's actually a very good point. You know, so mediator can make a rule that will prevent new entrants from new parties from entering the, entering the uh, uh, election. You, you know, but there is the opposite problem in India. There are 500 political parties, you know, and they keep making noise. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, uh, yeah. VCG mechanism. Okay, so A is the set of alternatives. You know, it's a VCG mechanism is very similar to this collective choice problem. Okay, and each player player i has valuation v i that maps a to r. Okay, and so the mediator's job, mediator seeks seeks vi from every i from every player i okay and then outputs a star in a so which alternative is going to be uh, enforced and pi which is the payment payment to every player i. Uh, well, this I, actually pi is the price, so let me just write it as price, not as a payment. 
price for every player i. So let's say the valuation space is capital V i. Okay, so in this case, mu consists of two things. First is a function, so mu comprises, so mu there comprises of a f that maps V1 cross Vn to A. That's one thing, and the second thing is P1, which might be a function of uh, V1 to Vn, and then P2, V1 to Vn, and so on. Okay, the payments for every player, the price for every player. Okay, so that's the idea for VCG mechanism. And uh, actually, VCG starts for Vickery, who won the, who wrote this paper in uh, 1961, I think, somewhere around 1961. He won a Nobel Prize for his work on auction theory. And then Clark and Groves, they are, they were co-workers, or I shouldn't say co-workers, but they actually worked on these class of problems for a long time, and uh, that's why they have. Collectively, this idea is known as VCG mechanism. I mean, this, this idea was not proposed in a single paper. It was an outcome of a years of research by several game theorists and government officials. Actually, Vickery is one of the few people who were awarded a Nobel Prize posthumously because Nobel Prize was announced on day one, and on day four, Vickery actually died of a heart attack. Okay, so he still won the Nobel Prize. He knew that he won the Nobel Prize, but he didn't live to actually receive it from the committee. Okay. What is the goal of the mediator? Mediator wants to make sure that each player gives the true valuation about the set of alternatives. And so it has to design, so there are two options, the two things that the mediator has to do. It has to figure out what should be the action, what should be the alternative chosen based on the valuation, and what should the prices be. So so find, so goal is find FP1 PN such that uh, ui of a, st a comma p given by vi a minus p is or a star and p star vi a star p star is greater than equal to u i a comma p okay so a star would be the optimal alternative and p star would be what prices the players are going to pay so this will be p star i okay so players will have no incentive to deviate from uh, the truthful behavior assuming that all other players are going to be truthful so we say so this is the uh, this is the definition of VCG mechanism. So the first part is f of v1 to vn is arg max of summation i equals one to n vi a a in capital A. Okay, so this is this is the socially optimal, socially optimal. Okay, so I will do what is best for everyone. Okay, and everyone is equal. So there are no 
there are no weights attached here. It's not wi multiplied by via. Each wi is equal to one. Everyone is equal, and I am going to do what is in the best interest of everyone. Okay, that's the mechanism. And the payment pi of v1 to vn is given as follows. It's equal to h of v minus i or h i of v minus i doesn't matter what this function is, but it can only depend on the valuations of other people minus summation j not equal to i v j a star. A star is this. A star is the arg max of the valuation. Okay, and it, you might think about, you know, this is a function of the valuations of other players. This is the function of valuation of other players. So pi actually doesn't depend on vi, but that's wrong because a star depends on vi. Okay, so this depends on vi. Okay, so pi actually depends on vi. Sorry? Hi. Hi is any other function. Okay? But it cannot depend on Vi. Okay? So we have, so this is, this is the original VCG mechanism. Okay? And then you have Clark. This is the C of VCG mechanism. Okay? Clark's pivot rule which says that h i of v minus i can be equal to uh, arc no max of a in a summation j not equal to i v i a Okay, so that's Clark's pivot rule. Okay, so the main result is the main result is this VCG mechanism, which is this one and two, is incentive <coughs> compatible. Okay, and of course, Clark's pivot rule has some more desirable properties. But if you don't care about those desirable properties, what you should know is that VCG mechanism, which is given by these two, uh, these two functions, these two maps, it's incentive compatible. So if every player is truthful, it is in the best interest of me to also be truthful. Okay. So that's a VCG mechanism. So, so that's that's a very strong property because you want incentive compatibility. And so how do you get incentive compatibility? So this, this could be, so let, let me talk about an example where this is kind of, uh, this is being studied right now uh, in the literature. So VI would be the cost of generating electricity. Okay, A would be how much electricity each generator has to produce. So that's a vector of generator one will produce five megawatt, generator two will produce three megawatt and so on. Okay, and you have some, throw in some renewable generators there who have some random production. So player I has valuation, so player I is a generator I, it has some cost function for generating electricity. Okay, so it will receive some payment because of generation of electricity. And then the mediator wants to make sure that each player provides the true cost of generating electricity. Okay, because I can always add some very high number to the cost and say that you know what, 
uh, I'm having some problem here and my cost is becoming very large. Uh, so accept a very large cost for generating electricity, okay? But Mediator doesn't want that to happen. Mediator wants VI from every player to be the true cost of generation, okay? So how should the Mediator price every generator or how much compensation should each generator be provided for generating electricity and what should be the optimal generation profile? Okay, so people are working on this, but of course there is randomness involved, so it's not as clean as what you see here. Uh, but it can be done, right? Whenever you have randomness, you lift it to a normal form game and you kind of do all the funny things that needs to be done to get the result. Okay, so, so VCG mechanism and incentive compatible. What about Clark's pivot rule? What kind of, what kind of uh, uh, properties does that satisfy? Let's see what the properties are. So definition a mechanism F P one P N is individually rational if U I A star P i star is greater than or equal to zero. So remember, I've defined it here. V i of a minus P i. That's that's U i. That's B i of a star minus P i star should be equal to. It should be greater than or equal to zero. Why should it be greater than or equal to zero? Well, I'm I'm paying for participating in this process. Okay. I don't want to participate in a process where overall my benefit, my value is going to be negative. Okay, I will just keep myself out of participation. So a mechanism is individually rational if the utility is strictly positive. Uh, not strictly positive, but it's greater than or equal to zero. And then that's definition number one. And then definition number two is we say no positive transfer if pi star is greater than or equal to zero for all i. What does this mean? Each player has to pay for participation, okay? You can't have a pi star that is negative, which means I'm paying you money to participate in this process, okay? I don't want that. I don't want a generator. Well, in the, in the generator case, of course, this will be negative, right? Uh, so PI will be positive number, and A star will be the set of generation. So, uh, but, but for the generation case, since you want to pay the generator for generating electricity, you don't want PI star to be positive in the generator's case, uh, because what it means is, you are asking the generator to pay me money and also produce electricity, okay? So you, want that, you don't want that to happen in the case of renewable generation. Now you might think, sorry, in the case of electricity market, you might think that, you know, that doesn't happen, but actually you are wrong. So in countries where you have huge renewable generation, sometimes the generation is much higher than the demand, in which case generates actually pay money to people so that they can consume the elect extra electricity in the market. So how does that happen? Well, they start pumping water up the dam, okay? So there is a dam. Technically, the water should flow down the dam, okay? But then they will start paying money to the person to start pumping water from the lower part of the dam to the upper part of the dam, okay? So that way they will consume the electricity. Uh, so that kind of thing happens and the generator will pay I'm generating too much electricity, I can't spend it, so I'm going to pay you, please spend it, okay? So that kind of thing happens, 
in 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 uh, in electricity market, especially where you have deep renewable integration. Okay, but ideally you would want to have no positive transfer, which means each person is paying in order to participate in this particular process. So that's the idea. Okay, so what's the lemma? And this lemma concerns Clark's pivot rule. VCG plus Clark's pivot rule implies PI is greater than PI star is greater than equal to zero for all I. That's number one. And number two, if VIA is greater than equal to zero for all I and A, then it's individually rational. Okay. So let's see why PI star should be greater than or equal to zero. If you look at PI star, that's equal to max over A summation VJA J not equal to I minus summation j not equal to i vj a star. Okay? And this always has to be greater than or equal to 0, right? Because you are taking the max over all a of summation of vj and then you are subtracting summation of vj evaluated at a specific point. So this will always be greater than or equal to 0. <coughs> What is this payment exactly equal to? Can someone interpret that payment? Can you interpret this payment? So what would happen if player I decided not to participate in this mechanism? Then A star, if player I did not participate, then A star would be arg max of A for summation J not equal to I, v I Vj of A, right? So, so this is essentially A minus I star. So if player I did not participate, this is what the outcome would be of the uh, of the mechanism, okay, and this is what the total value would be of the mechanism. But since player I participated, this is what the outcome is, and this is what the total value is. So player I's payment is equal to the value, the total value that would have been if he did not participate minus the total value that is since he has participated, okay. So you can think of it in that sense, okay? So PI star is some sort of punishment for participating in this auction. Not in this auction, but in this mechanism. Okay? And if VIA is greater than or equal to zero, then PI star would also, would, you can prove that PI star is going to be less than or equal to VI of A. So VIA star minus PI star is going to be strictly not strictly, but it's going to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay. So this is uh, this is the most important result in mechanism design. Okay. This is uh, one of the few mechanisms which are incentive compatible and also have. And if you use, if you couple it with Clark's pivot rule, you have some more desirable properties. Uh, that you would otherwise not have. Okay, that's why it's studied very well. Uh, and once you understand VCG mechanism very well, then you can 
prove a series of results for various different settings. Okay, so the first setting that we will consider is that of auctions. Okay, do we have time? We have time. Okay, so I'll I'll take I'll take some questions right now, and if there are no questions, I'll move on to auctions, which is our next topic. <coughs> yes. Second definition. This is no positive transfer. So this is the definition. So you say that there is no positive transfer if P i star is greater than or equal to zero. It means that the mechanism designer is not paying money to the people to participate or to the players to participate in this. Okay. So P i star is what the players are paying to the mediator or to the mechanism designer. Okay. So you want people to pay to the mechanism designer, not the other way around. Yeah, so this is written in terms of value and payment. Uh, in the case of electricity market, it would be cost and the payment that the generators will receive as profit, right? So as, as, as a payment for generating for the electricity that he generated and provided to the market. So the first application that I want to study is that of uh, auction, okay? Single item auction. Any any question on this? No other questions? Well, I'll I'll just keep it there. So single item, item auction. Uh, the idea is there is an item. Each person has a valuation for that item. Uh, so let's say this is the item, okay? And player I. values value is w i so what the mechanism designer has to do is it wants to know what is the maximum value okay so the designer chooses j star J star, which is the person receiving the item, and P star, which is the price at which item is sold. Okay. So you can define VI as follows, VI of J star, or rather let me just define it as UI. UI of J star comma P star is equal to WI minus P star if I, if J equals J star equals I and zero otherwise okay so this is the value that player i has and this is the price that he paid so this is the extra value that is created if player i wins if player i wins this auction if player i doesn't doesn't win this auction then he gets zero okay he doesn't get the item <coughs> okay it will turn out well let's look at let's look at what What VCG mechanism tells us, uh, let's, let's first find out what PI should be with Clark's pivot mechanism. Uh, 
or let me just write it completely. I need more space. So this is uh, the 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 idea is as follows: your i or j star is going to be arg max of w i i in one to n. Okay, so that will be j star if you solve if you solve this problem, and then the p star is different. So what is p j star? So I'll compute. So, so let's compute p i star first. P i star for i not equal to j star for i not equals to j star. So this is the summation of value v i of uh, max over a v i of a minus summation v i of a star or v i of j star. And this is i j not equals to i. And this is for j not equals to i. So this is basically what, what uh, somebody would pay if player i who didn't win this auction, if player i who didn't win this auction, if he did not participate, what is the total value? And what is the total value when he did participate? But since player i was not the winner, he actually didn't change the value because his value is 0. right? So his value is 0. He didn't actually change the value of the overall outcome. And therefore, this is going to be equal to 0. Is his value 0 or is it the price? It, so, you know, you have to, let's say I write it as pj star, and then this will be minus pj star. So the value will be wi if j star was equal to i and 0 if j star was not equal to i. So vi j star equals to wi if j star equals to i, 0 otherwise. OK? So if you do the sum of all valuations and take the arg max, this is what you are going to get. j star should be equal to arg max wi. And pi star, which in this case would be, OK? So if player i did not participate, this is going to be 0. If player i did participate, this is going to be 0. So. It's 0 minus 0, which is equal to 0. If i did not win this auction, now let's say if i did win this auction, p j star star, what would be the maximum value? What would be the maximum value if player j star did not participate in the auction? So that's going to be the second maximum of wi, right? So if so remember j star is the one that has the maximum wi so let me write w bar as second max over all i of wi so this is the this is the arg max and this is the second arg max second max whatever that is okay so this will be w bar minus 0. Would this be 0? Yeah, that's the sum of the value of all other people given that j star actually won the auction. right? So that's equal to 0. So what you get is w bar. So, so, so look at this counterintuitive phenomena. In this case, this is the Clark's pivot mechanism. This is Clark's pivot, pivot rule. So what this is saying is, well, it's fine. You know, if you think about an auction, you would say, you know what, whoever has the maximum value should win the auction. Okay, that's, that's 
very counter, that's very intuitive. That's what we said. But then you have to design what the price the person should pay. And what I'm saying is, well, everyone else is going to pay zero price, but the person who wins the auction is going to pay the second highest price. Not the highest price, not its own valuation, but the second highest price among all the bidders who actually bid on the item. If you recall all the movies you might have seen, you don't see this happening anywhere. Okay. <laughs> so so if, if I recall from the movies, the way an auction works is, you know, I'll say, who wants this duster? Okay, one dollar, somebody will raise the hand, and then I'll say, okay, I'll increase it to two dollars, and few hands will go down, and so on. Okay? Uh, and so the price will be whatever the person decided at the end. You know, like if there's one person who raises his hand, he gets it at that price. But what this is saying is, you know what? <laughs> it should be that person, well, you see the information structure is different because everyone is seeing who values how much. Right? In this case, nobody sees who values how much. Okay? It, everything is confidential in some sense. So if everything is confidential, then the second highest price should be the price of the, of the object. So if I want to go and sell my house, I'll ask everyone to bid, and I will give the house to the maximum bidder, but not at the price that he quoted. I'll give him the price, which is the second highest uh, price that was bid for my house. It's very counterintuitive, but uh, it seems to have all the incentive compatibility and all those things, um, all those properties. What was it? Incentive compatible, no positive transfer, and ex post individually rational. Okay. This is valid only when the confidentiality yes. is part of the structure. That's right. That's part. Now, if you look at eBay auction, for instance, it's not confidential. I don't know how many of you have done eBay auction. Okay, I did it a lot when I was a graduate student, uh, and also first year of my faculty job. Okay, after that, I didn't have the time to do auction. Uh, so the way the auction works is, you go, you put a price. You know, here is a pair of shoes. Uh, how much do you want to pay for it? So I'll go and say, okay, I'm going to pay twenty dollars for these pair of shoes. Okay, which actually would cost me sixty dollars. Uh, then somebody else will see, you know, this shoes is, somebody has bid $20 on it, let me increase the bid to $21. So that person can actually see my bid, okay? So, so that's a completely different information structure, okay? And we'll study eBay auctions uh, in the next class when I talk about auction theory. Uh, uh, but, but in that case, the confidentiality is not there, okay? My bid is not confidential. Uh, in this case, the bids are supposed to be confidential. In fact, whatever we have studied so far, everything is confidential, just like it was the case in correlated equilibrium. I tell you what you have to act, but I don't tell you what others are going to do. Right? So that is for you to deduce what others are going to do and then take the best action that you want to take. Okay. And this is known as second price auction. Second price auction. Okay, so that's the famous second price auction. So in the next class, I'll talk about auction theory, where I'll talk about first price auction, second price auction, English auction, Dutch auction, and procurement auction. And those are all different types of auctions that we'll, we'll study and we'll see what their properties are, what their incentive compatibility properties are in the next class. All right, thank you.